This is the moment. This is our moment. Our moment. Our moment. Baseball has always been America's pastime, but the U.S. is far from the only country where baseball is immensely popular. Of course, Latin America and the Caribbean have long had strong ties to the game. However, baseball is also the most popular sport in Asian countries like Japan and South Korea. And it's been like that for a long time. Today, it's impossible to deny that Asia has produced some of baseball's biggest stars. Most notably, there's Shohei Otani, who has the largest contract in MLB history and is on a path to becoming the greatest player in baseball history. Now, of course, Otani was far from the first player from Asia to become a star in the big leagues, nor will he be the last. There's a long fly ball, right center field. Outman goes back near the wall. That ball is gone. For decades, the top players in Asia have come to America to compete against the best players in the world. Some have struggled, some have excelled, but before we get into the careers of prominent Asian baseball players and the lasting impact they've had, how about a quick history lesson? Before the end of the 19th century, baseball had been introduced to Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and other Asian countries. Among those countries, Japan ended up leading the way on the baseball front with a professional league as early as the 1920s. And as we know, Japan has emerged as an international powerhouse, winning the inaugural World Baseball Classic in 2006. The Japanese team also won the WBC in 2009 and 2023, while South Korea proudly represented Asia with a third place finish in 2006 and runner-up honors in 2009. Nearly a century before Japan's WBC success, though, Harry Kingman became the first Asian player to compete in the big leagues. Born in China, Kingman made his MLB debut with the Yankees on July 1st, 1914. Now, his time in the majors was brief. You know, his time with the Yankees lasted less than two months. He played in just four games and went hitless in three at-bats, but he was the first Asian player in the majors. The trailblazer, though, that most people don't know about but should is Masanori Murakami. In 1964, Murakami became the first player from Japan in the big leagues. When he was just 20 years old and spoke little English, Murakami came to the U.S. His Japanese team initially sent him to play for an A-ball team in the San Francisco Giants organization as an exchange student. But when his team forgot to call him back, the Giants promoted Murakami to the big leagues, and he pitched for the Giants during the final month of the 1964 season. They were impressed enough that they refused to send him back to his Japanese club. Murakami then spent the 1965 season with the Giants before ultimately returning to Japan after a short career in the big leagues. Pitching as a reliever in 1965, Murakami threw 74 and a third innings, struck out 85 batters, and went 4-1 and one with a 3.75 ERA. While Kingman and Murakami have largely been forgotten, they helped to set the stage for other Asian players to come to the big leagues. For most baseball fans, the first Asian player of the modern era to put his stamp on the big leagues was Hideo Nomo. Known for his unique tornado-style windup, his blistering fastball, and his tricky forkball, Nomo made his debut with the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1995. At the time, he was the first Japanese player to make his MLB debut since Murakami in 1965, a nearly 30-year gap. At the time of Nomo's arrival, fans were intrigued by his unusual delivery and the surrounding hype, right? But they were also skeptical about how his success as a five-time All-Star in Japan's Nippon Professional Baseball League would translate to the big leagues. But if there were questions about Nomo, they were answered pretty quickly. In 28 starts as a rookie, Nomo went 13-6 with a 2.54 ERA, earning his first and only All-Star selection while also winning Rookie of the Year. Even more impressive, Nomo's 236 strikeouts were enough to lead the league, despite not making his MLB debut until May and pitching fewer than 200 innings. With an average of 11.1 strikeouts per nine innings, Nomo broke the Dodgers' single-season franchise record, overtaking the legendary Sandy Koufax. Throughout his first season in the majors, Nomo became a global sensation. Not only were Americans captivated by his success, but his games were broadcast live in Japan. With countless eyes watching his every pitch, Nomo never folded under pressure. In fact, Nomo was nearly as good in his second season, even after hitters had a chance to adjust to him. Nomo went 16-11 and with a 3.19 ERA in 1996, and in September of that season, Nomo threw a no-hitter against the Colorado Rockies. 
Obviously, this was the first no-hitter ever thrown by an Asian pitcher in the big leagues. And even more amazing, Nomo threw the no-hitter at Coors Field, which is arguably the most hitter-friendly park in baseball history. To date, Nomo remains the only pitcher to ever throw a no-hitter at Coors Field. Alas, Nomo's hype train eventually slowed down, though. His first two seasons were among the best of his career. But from 1998 to 2001, he bounced around from team to team, struggled to find consistency. A return to the Dodgers in 2002 once again brought out the best in Nomo, though. He matched his career high of 16 wins in both 2002 and 2003, posting a sub 3.5 ERA in both seasons. And when all was said and done, Nomo spent more than a decade in the big leagues. He amassed 123 wins and nearly 2,000 strikeouts with a career 4.24 ERA and two, yeah, two no-hitters. Now, history won't remember him as the best Japanese pitcher of all time, but he was the first Japanese pitcher of the modern era to prove that success in Asia's baseball leagues could translate to success in the big leagues. Now, around that same time that Nomo came to the big leagues, Chanho Park did the same. Park actually made his MLB debut with the Dodgers in April 1994, more than a year before Nomo's debut, but Park would end up spending most of his first two seasons in the U.S. pitching in the minors. However, when Park made his big league debut on April 8, 1994, he made history as the first player from South Korea to ever appear in the big leagues, creating a path that dozens of other Koreans have followed since. By 1996, Park was pitching full-time in the big leagues. In 1997, he was a bona fide frontline starter, winning 14 games for the Dodgers and posting a 3.38 ERA, which was the first of five straight seasons in which Park won at least 13 games. He also had a sub 4.0 ERA in four of those five seasons. In 1999, Park's career got something of a black eye when he became the first pitcher to allow two grand slams in the same inning, which you might remember if you saw our episode on Fernando Tatis Jr., but he managed to rebound from that and had a long career for the Dodgers, Rangers, and several other teams. Park finished his career in the big leagues in 2010 with a 4.36 ERA and 124 wins, one more than Nomo. And for the moment, at least, Park remains the all-time leader in career wins by an Asian pitcher. After the success of Nomo and Park, a slew of other pitchers from Japan and South Korea followed in their footsteps. Not all of them matched the success of those two. Hideki Irabu joined the Yankees in 1997 and, despite winning two World Series rings, never quite lived up to expectations, finishing his MLB career with a 5.15 ERA. Others flew under the radar a little bit too, but had solid careers. South Korea's Byung-Hyung Kim pitched nine seasons in the big leagues, pitching the World Series when the Diamondbacks won it all in 2001. He was also an all-star in 2002 and joined the short list of pitchers to throw an immaculate inning. Tomo Oka also had a noteworthy career. Now he was far from a star in Japan, but took a chance by coming to the majors and found success. Oka spent time with five different franchises from 1999 to 2009, and his career ERA in the big leagues was actually lower than it was in the NPB. Oh, and Oka also threw a 77-pitch perfect game while in AAA in 2000. Kazuhiro Sasaki, another overlooked Japanese pitcher. Now, he's largely forgotten because he spent just four seasons in the majors before returning to Japan, but in those four years, Sasaki was a two-time All-Star and took home Rookie of the Year honors in 2000. Now, in the beginning, Asian players coming to the big leagues were exclusively pitchers, but that changed in 2001 when Ichiro Suzuki became the first position player from Asia to sign with a big league club. And Ichiro joining the Seattle Mariners ended up becoming like one of the most significant moments in baseball history. Regardless of his place of birth, Ichiro has one of the greatest baseball stories of any player ever. He didn't come to the big leagues on a whim. Before coming to Seattle, he had already spent nine seasons in the MPB, where he was a bona fide superstar. We're talking about a guy who won seven consecutive Pacific League batting titles, seven consecutive gold glove awards, and three Pacific League MVPs. Ichiro was simply the preeminent and dominant figure in Japan for nearly a decade. He was far and away Japan's best player during the 90s. And it's hard to find an MLB equivalent for Ichiro during his time in Japan because virtually no MLB player has ever been that much better than his peers for that long a time. Yet, countless fans and pundits expected Ichiro to fail when he got to the big leagues. 
They said he was too small to be a star in the majors. They said he was too frail to endure a 162 game season. They didn't think he had enough power to make an impact or that his approach would work against the best pitchers in the world. There are no words to express how wrong these people were. When Ichiro got to the majors, he didn't hit the ground running, he hit the ground sprinting. It was like if Usain Bolt were somehow able to maintain his top speed for the full length of a marathon. As a rookie, Ichiro hit 350 with 50 extra base hits and 56 stolen bases. With 242 hits, he led the majors in that category and broke the rookie record for hits, which stood since 1927. Ichiro also became the first player since Jackie Robinson did it in 1949 to lead the majors in both hits and stolen bases. After his rookie season, the accolades just kept pouring in for Ichiro. On top of being an all-star, he won both Rookie of the Year and MVP honors. He won the American League batting title and his first of three Silver Slugger awards. He also won the first of what would become 10 consecutive Gold Glove awards. But it wasn't all about individual accomplishments. Ichiro was the catalyst for a team that tied the all-time record with 116 wins during the regular season. That was 25 more wins than the Mariners won the previous season, by the way. In just one season, Ichiro's impact on the field and culturally as Japan's first position player in the majors was almost immeasurable. Of course, that was just one season, and Ichiro was far from a one-season wonder. On top of winning 10 straight gold gloves, he became the first MLB player to collect at least 200 hits in 10 straight seasons. And in each of those 10 seasons, Ichiro hit over 300, including a career high of 372 in 2004, while also stealing at least 30 bases in 10 of his first 11 seasons in the majors. In retrospect, Ichiro should have been called the Energizer Bunny of Japan because he never seemed to stop even though he didn't reach the majors until he was 27 and had nine years of wear and tear on a frame some believed was too frail to last one season in the big leagues, Ichiro played nearly two decades in the majors. He made his debut in 2001 with the Mariners and came full circle playing his final game on opening day for the Mariners in 2019. Fittingly, that game was actually played at Japan's Tokyo Dome. At the time of his retirement, Ichiro was 45. Between his 19 seasons in the majors and nine years in Japan, Ichiro played 28 seasons of professional baseball, surpassing the 27 seasons played by Nolan Ryan and 19th century Hall of Famer Cap Anson. For his career, Ichiro collected 3,089 hits, 509 stolen bases, and 780 RBIs with a career batting average of 311. In 2025, when he's on the ballot for the first time, Ichiro will become the first Asian player inducted into the Hall of Fame. And at least for the time being, until Shohei Otani inevitably passes him, Ichiro is the best player to ever come out of Japan. Now, of course, an important part of Ichiro's legacy is how he opened the door for other position players from Asia to make the leap to the big leagues. He proved that it could be done and inspired others to try. While not every position player to move from an Asian league to the majors would succeed, those who did owe a lot of their success to Ichiro and the guys that came before him. Hideki Matsui was among the first to follow Ichiro's path to the majors. He was a nine-time All-Star and three-time Central League MVP in Japan. Nicknamed Godzilla for his immense power, Matsui turned down a $64 million offer to stay in Japan to sign with the Yankees for $21 million over three years. In New York, Matsui became an instant hit, narrowly missing out on Rookie of the Year honors while being named an All-Star in 2003 and 2004. He drove in over 100 runs in four of his first five seasons with the Yankees and also earned World Series MVP honors when he helped the Bronx Bombers to a championship in 2009. And just like Ichiro, Matsui didn't get to the big leagues until his late 20s. But that didn't stop him from spending 10 seasons in the majors, hitting 282 with 175 home runs over his career. Next in line came Shinsu Chu. When he made his debut with the Mariners in 2005, Chu was just the second Korean-born player in the big leagues behind largely unheralded infielder Hee Sop Choi. Unlike Ichiro and Matsui, Chu didn't hit the ground running in the US. He was just 22 at the time of his MLB debut in 2005 and needed some time to find his footing. However, Chu would eventually forge his own path that led him to accomplish things no Asian player, including Ichiro and Matsui, had ever done before. 
By 2008, Chu had found his groove, batting at least 300 for the first of three consecutive seasons, while also posting a career-high OPS of 946. The following year, Chu became the first Asian player in the big leagues to join the 2020 club. It was a feat he'd accomplished two more times in his career. In 2015, Chu made history yet again, becoming the first Asian player to hit for the cycle. Not even Ichiro did that during his time in the majors. Somewhat unfairly, I think Chu was selected to just one All-Star game during his 16 seasons in the majors, and it came on the back end of his career in 2018. Of course, thanks to his longevity, Chu finished his MLB career with 218 career home runs, surpassing Matsui for the most homers in the big leagues by an Asian player. Even more amazing, after Chu's time in the majors ended after the 2020 season, he returned to South Korea and kept playing. Much like Ichiro, Chu's career has continued past the age of 40. In his first pitch, hammered out to center field. That one carrying very... Thanks to the likes of Ichiro, Matsui, and Chu, a slew of other position players from Asia tried their hand in the big leagues. Infielder Jung Ho Kang put together a few nice seasons for the Pirates. Fellow infielder Kaz Matsui endured some rough and tumble years adjusting to the majors, but managed to stick around the big leagues for seven seasons. Outfielder Kosuke Fukudome spent five seasons in the majors and was an all-star in 2008. Nori Aoki had a whirlwind career in the majors, spending six seasons playing for seven different teams after helping Japan to its first two WBC titles in 2006 and 2009. More recently, Seiya Suzuki and Masataka Yoshida have made their way from the MPB to the MLB and have continued to prove that top flight position players from Asia belong in the majors. Of course, Asia's best baseball exports have always been pitchers. That continues to be the case with the current crop of Asian stars taking the mound for MLB clubs. Lefty Hyunjin Ryu was a seven-time All-Star in South Korea's KBO before joining the Dodgers in 2013. He quickly became a weapon on the mound, winning 14 games in each of his first two seasons. And with time, Ryu got even better, pitching to a 1.97 ERA in an injury-shortened 2018 season and winning 14 games again in both 2019 with the Dodgers and 2021 with the Blue Jays. He also earned an All-Star selection in 2019 when he led the majors with a 2.32 ERA. Despite some injuries in recent years, Ryu has lasted over a decade in the big leagues as a frontline starter on top of his seven dominant seasons in Korea. Kenta Maeda is another Asian pitcher who has found long-term success in the U.S. He dominated the MPB during the first half of the 2010s before joining the Dodgers in 2016. Through seven seasons in the majors, Maeda has compiled 65 wins and an ERA under four. Alas, the best Asian pitcher of the past decade, and perhaps the best we've ever seen, is Yu Darvish. Like so many who came before him, Darvish proved over years in the MPB that he was ready to pitch in the big leagues. Once he got to the majors, Darvish wasted no time in showing that he could dominate against the best hitters in the world. After winning 16 games for the Rangers in his first season, Darvish led the American League in strikeouts during his second year in the big leagues, helping him finish second in the Cy Young voting. Seven years later, Darvish was the Cy Young runner-up yet again after leading the National League in wins during the 2020 season. Throughout his first 11 big league seasons, Darvish has amassed over 100 wins and nearly 2,000 strikeouts, while helping his team reach the postseason five times. He's also been part of Japan's last two WBC titles. Now, whether Darvish remains the best pitcher to come out of Japan remains to be seen. The generation of Asian pitchers following in his footsteps looks pretty promising. Kode Senga finished second Rookie of the Year voting and received Cy Young consideration in his first season with the Mets. There's also insane amounts of hype surrounding Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who got a 12-year, $325 million contract from the Dodgers before throwing one pitch in the majors. And then there's Shohei Otani. One-two pitch. He struck him out. The two-way sensation from Japan is literally like nothing baseball has ever seen before. He was an all-star in Japan as a teenager and was a revelation in the MPB for five seasons as both an elite pitcher and hitter. And when Otani arrived in the big leagues, things kind of just continued that way. Over his first six seasons in the big leagues, Otani was twice a unanimous MVP because of his ability to be one of the league's best hitters and a frontline starting pitcher. In 2023, Otani was a first-team All-MLB selection as both a pitcher and a DH. 
and that cemented his standing as both one of the best hitters and the best pitchers to come out of Asia. But if the next handful of seasons are anything like Otani's first six seasons in the majors, this two-way sensation is poised to become the best player in baseball history. Even if there isn't another two-way player on Otani's level, the pipeline between Asia and the big leagues has never been stronger. And the next in line appears to be Rintaro Sasaki, who comes from the same high school in Japan that Otani attended. Sasaki is forging his own path in a different way. Rather than trying to prove himself in the NPB before going to the big leagues, Sasaki will play college baseball in the US at Stanford. No other Asian to play in the big leagues has ever attended an American college beforehand. If Sasaki succeeds in getting to the majors, it could open up a whole new avenue for Asian players to get to the big leagues, further increasing Asia's influence and impact in the baseball world. It's like we said at the beginning, America isn't the only country that's embraced baseball. Countries like Japan, South Korea, and others in Asia have been baseball mad for decades. And that passion has translated into some of baseball's biggest stars. And even with so many past and present Asian players in the majors already, it's possible we've only scratched the surface of what Asian players have to offer. All right, that's it for this video. Let us know what you thought down in the comments. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.